I always say to people, to be where we are today compared to where we started is like landing on the moon. It is astounding. And you can't appreciate where we are today unless you understand the transformation from where we came. The thing that put Barry Waymiller on the map was in 1901, Mr. Waymiller built an experimental pasteurization machine for the Anheuser-Busch Brewing Association. So he developed this, it's actually a huge tank that they had a conveyor belt go through that people would load beer bottle in a basket. In effect, the basket would go through these various big dipping tanks of hot water which would cook the beer, kill the bacteria, and therefore breweries could start shipping beer outside their own town because they had uh, cooked the beer. My father worked for Arthur Anderson. He was an auditor, and the banks for Barry Waymiller required the company to have an audit to assure the financial statements were appropriate that they'd lent against. And my dad was, happened to be the person responsible for the Barry Waymiller audit, came out, got involved in the audit. The company was not doing well, and uh, so my dad got to know Fred Waymiller, who was the obviously the son of Mr. Waymiller, the inventor, who had died in about 1915. And uh, he was running the company at the time. He was a great engineer, not a great businessman. And uh, my dad kind of was that businessman, so they hit it off. My father was enticed by a job offer to actually get into a business instead of being kind of on the sidelines auditing a business. So the quite often the intriguing thing is a chance to actually not be an auditor to review companies, but to actually get involved and do something. Now, my mother would say to this day, why on earth did he leave Arthur Anderson a secure, good profession and go with a very weak company? The answer is it's tempting to actually leave public accounting and get into a real business. So it was the first job offer he'd had of any significance. And I think he joined the company as general manager, assistant to the president and treasurer or something like that. Whether he really thought he could improve it, I assume he did. You know, I was five years old, so he didn't really review the decision with me, but uh, it was a pretty bad situation. Canned beer was starting to come out. non returnable glass was starting to come out. We had German competition. You know, there were just a lot of negatives. Very concentrated market, very concentrated technology and not good financially. So there wasn't really much going for it other than it would have been around for 100 years. In the mid-50s, uh, he was given an opportunity to invest in the company. And my dad, but my dad didn't have any money, so he had to borrow $30,000, which he did. And then in about 1957, Mr. Waymiller passed away. So the family made my dad president. My dad still had a small amount of stock in this company that was continued to struggle. And this group in Chicago came in and to my dad and said, we will lend the company enough money that you can buy the Waymillers out. And therefore, your stock, Mr. Chapman, will be 57%, because there's only a few shareholders other than the Waymillers. And it was the VP of Finance, the VP of Engineering, the VP of Production. My dad went to the other gentlemen who were executives and said, look, I'm not trying to control this company. We've got this opportunity to acquire the company from the Waymillers. We've got the money. If you would like to put in more money, so you've got a larger stake in the, the residual stock, that's fine with me. And everybody's reaction to a person was, well, you know, I, I just, my daughter's going to college. I just bought a new house. I'm not really good. What they really said, there's no way I'm going to put another nickel in this company. So my dad said, fine. They did the transaction. Our family became the majority owner. And then over the next maybe 10 years, 
as each person retired, the company retired their stock. So I think our family stock got up into the mid to high 90s. It was a pretty sad state of affairs when my dad walked in. So there wasn't a lot of talent direction. And so a gentleman, Bob Pear, uh, who was kind of the uh, sales administrator, you know, he worked for the vice president of sales, but the vice president of sales had left because it was looking pretty bad. So my dad, not many choices, gave Bob Pear the chance to, to run sales. And Bob Pear got an order from Pabst Brewing in Peoria, Illinois for a bottle washer. And he got a down payment on that bottle washer. That down payment was the beginning. That order and that down payment was the beginning of this fragile recovery. Bob Pierre saved my dad's life because he had a tremendous skill with customers. He's a natural sales executive. So the company started rebuilding. But two of the executives of the company, the VP of Finance and the VP of Production, had decided that the best thing would be for the company to be sold. So they started talking, independent of my dad, about trying to find a buyer. My dad found this out, and it was very difficult for my dad. So my dad decided that he would start with his secretary, Virginia, opening the mail every day. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to know what letters were coming in. So every morning when my dad got in, he and Virginia went down to the mail room and they opened every piece of mail and put it in the boxes. I had never considered working for the company, ever. I was gonna be a public accountant. I was gonna be a partner. Never, I mean, it's amazing. I never even thought about working for the company through my business school, graduate school, and my job. My dad's statement to me is, A, I was doing well, and B, he was growing frustrated with his leadership team. He said, I just need somebody I can trust. So that is kind of how bad it was when I stepped into the company um, in 1969. What he did for me was trust me, and give me complete freedom to develop my competency in the company. I mean, my first job in Barry Winmore was I was, I worked in the engineering department. I came out of public accounting, and what did I do? Well, I worked as the project coordinator between Owens, Illinois and Barry I managed the relationship between Barry Winmore and Owens, Illinois on these projects, just from a common sense. So I learned engineering, and then I went into, got involved in manufacturing, and then I got involved in international relations. So one of the greatest things my dad did for me, he, he gave me the freedom for intellectual curiosity to learn about the business. A business sometimes looks very simple. You build a machine, you sell it, and you make money, okay? But behind that, there is a lot of things that have to come together to create something. And what I got a chance to do is take a watch apart. I got a chance to take the business apart to understand how the watch works. I had had dinner with my dad at Steak and Shake over on Manchester Road with my mom and dad because they were leaving the next day for Australia. My dad was great. We had a nice conversation. The best years I ever had in my life with my dad was when we worked together. So we'd had six good years together. And when I got the call the next morning that he had passed out and died of a heart attack, um, I was shocked. The night before uh, my father died, he said, um, you know, Bob, I'm gonna make you executive vice president because you're really kind of running the company and I want your title to reflect that. Bob, um, being a young man as, as we were both were, had a load dumped on his shoulders. When you're handed uh, such a large operation, Trying to find your way is, uh, is, a, is a tedious process. And uh, he tried uh, different approaches. Some were successful, some were not. 
The mission was clear. We had to improve our financial performance, reduce our debt, if we were going to have a future. When the bankers pulled our loan within days of my father's death, I grabbed a hold of that business and we had, in the next nine months, for the, therefore the full financial year, the strongest financial performance in the 100-year history of the company. It was the story of St. Louis. Uh, we went from 18 to 72 million dollars in four years, and we began a series of initiatives. We had hired a NASA engineer from Donald Douglas, who took us into the field of solar energy as a method of heating up pasteurizers, which gave us an idea for the future of our pasteurization process technology. Uh, they evolved into a solar energy project that Anheuser-Busch evaluated and felt was the finest in the country. At that time, it was uh, the fuel energy crisis, and Anheuser Bush advertised solar brewed beer, and it was it was uh, quite an exciting time. I moved here from Kansas City. That's the primary reason for taking this job. It sounded like a good offer. It was right up my alley, and uh, the company was booming. We did pasteurizer development, washer development, and label removal. We um, had a uh, electronic bottle inspector we had developed called the Questron which in fact was ahead of its time. Uh, we were doing gangbusters. We were building 52 major machines a year, large, and that's not even the spare parts. We didn't have a lot of competition. Uh, we had backlogs that went out 18 months. It was, they were coming to us, the customers, wanting our machines, and we would tell them when it was that they would get their machine, and they would have to wait in line. That was, that was norm. That was acceptable to the customer. So it was a dramatic turnaround, uh, but it was a combination of the shock of my dad's death and, and I was ready for the position, and the shock of the bank pulling that said, we're going to turn this place around. And I was not encumbered by anything. And it was a ramping up phase and everybody was so swamped. Um, it was a, a good feeling to be busy at the time, um, but ramping up isn't so easy. When you have to hire lots of contractors, then you're talking about you know, digging into margins, et cetera, et cetera. $600,000 in one year just recruiting new vice president of production, new vice president of engineering, new vice president of personnel, people under him. I mean, just, I mean, we were spending half our time recruiting people, sharing this journey, sharing the passion where we're going. The customer, be it Anheuser-Busch or Miller, would come in to inspect their machines before shipment. They wouldn't even be looking at their own machine. They would be spending their time looking at, if it was Anheuser-Busch, Miller's machine to see what it was they were buying. And, and it was just, it was just glorious for Barry Waymiller. We just kind of, we just kind of sit back and, and thought, this is a never-ending type of situation. It's a curve that's going to go right off the graph. Our experience was, well, you know, we have a, a straight line extrapolation of this growth. <laughs> it's going to continue along this line forever. We didn't really see that there was a cliff that we were were marching towards. All of a sudden, we started hearing from Seminazi. We started hearing from different breweries or equipment makers that weren't a threat in the past, and they were coming in, and they were trying to sell to Bush and sell to Miller and sell to anybody that wanted to buy their product. Anheuser-Busch went with Palma, and all of a sudden, we lost all of their business. Each one of those bubbles began to burst simultaneously. Uh, the cumulative effect of that was a period of traumatic decline. Right about that time, though, um, they, they started, America started phasing out bottle washing, period. And it, it cost us dearly because the brewing industry was all returnable bottles, as was the soft drink industry. The soft drink companies and the breweries were removing th these machines at uh, a really fast rate. All things uh, 
uh, come to an end, I guess, in this business because uh, the brewing industry was cyclical and uh, we were tied very close to the brewing industry, so as they went, so did we. And all of a sudden, instead of building new breweries, breweries started buying other breweries, which took our demand from here to here. At the time, we were borrowing $17 million at 22% interest rates. And they froze our line of credit, which means we couldn't borrow another nickel. And uh, it put us into a state of crisis. I will never forget that meeting or that day because my whole life was before me in terms of my ability to support my family, the people that joined us on this journey, uh, the directors that had, had confidence in me. The world looked fairly dark to me that day. Once that happened, yes, it was, it was a very grim circumstance. We had to start cutting people uh, pretty dramatically, cut back on all, all of the expenditures where we could. Uh, we you know, just did those things that were necessary for survival. Didn't go to trade shows. Vendors are knocking at our door for payments. I had the utility companies at the, at the door at the receptionist with their wrenches to turn off the utilities. You know, people get their paychecks and the first thing they do is they go to the banks. Because it was, it was very, very hard times. I mean, 52 major machines selling at $2 million, approximately, you know, one to two million a piece, and we go down to seven machines a year. That's a big adjustment. It was tough for folks to, uh, to move on. We actually came to a point of layoffs, which is something our culture wouldn't do today. But we did have those, what we call Black Fridays, where we had to sit by our phone and uh, wait for the call of, would we still be there? On, on Monday. It was a struggle. We lost a lot of good people because they didn't feel safe. Um, they didn't feel secure. I can understand that. It was, it was, it was hard. It was hard. Yeah, I played at uh, Emerson Electric down the street from West Florissant, um, and they actually hired me. Um, it was on a Friday, and I thought about it over the weekend. I just loved the folks I was working with, and changed my mind over the weekend, and just showed back up on Monday. So I walked into the coffee room over at West Florissant. And on the floor, on his hands and knees, is some serviceman, and obviously very frustrated trying to, to, to take apart the coffee machine. So I'm literally stepping over his legs, and I go get a cup of coffee, and he looks up at me, and he says, enjoy your last cup of coffee. And I said, well, what, are you, what are you talking about? And he says, this company doesn't pay their bills, and I'm taking this coffee machine away. So they were basically repossessing the coffee machine on my first day. So I walked back into the boardroom and I said to Bob, I don't know about my three-year plan, but my three-minute plan is to make sure this company has coffee. We learned more in that nine months than we had ever learned in our life about how to run a business, how to get through difficult times. When a bank that has been your primary lender for a long time, um, all of a sudden pulls even though somebody else could look at you and say, well, gee, you look like a reasonable person, company to lend to. You're tainted by a bank that said, this was one of our large clients and we want out and we want out now. So we had a lot of people interested. A lot of people seemed like they were gonna lend us money. But when they got into it, the overwhelming issue in their minds was, well, why wouldn't Boatman's continue lending to them. Why would we step in and take them out? We ended up getting financed with asset-based lending out of Citicorp in Chicago because Citicorp St. Louis office had a gentleman working in it whose father happened to used to work in our storeroom. Um, and therefore, because his father used to work here, he went to great lengths to try and convince Citicorp in Chicago to make an asset-based loan. That's a very intense environment where you have to have daily reporting, you have to understand what your receivables are, what sales you, you had that generate those receivables, what you need as far as payables. It's a very stressful time, and the one lesson you learn when you go through something like that is once you've been broke, you never want to be broke again. We were in, um, in a position that was very tentative because uh, we had uh, very few orders coming in. Uh, international sales actually kept us afloat. And uh, the, the domestic market was flat at best. It was horrific. We all thought we were going to lose our jobs. 
And then, then one day, uh, through the many genius efforts of our sales team, uh, Bob Pear, a lot of others included, made a sale to Service Rio Modelo that pulled us out of the water. It stopped us from drowning. A friend of mine said, have you ever thought, Bob, about having an advisory board? You know, this is when I was starting to grow like this and it was exciting and dynamic. And I said, uh, no, I really haven't thought about it, you know, because we just kind of had the board I inherited, you know, which was internal. And he said, well, you know, Bob, there's some incredible executives that really, in the interest of reaching out, helping you, you could get to be on your advisory board and it would be, I think, very helpful to you at this, you know, I was 31 by then, uh, years old, and really helpful to you. He, he and I met at a uh, Brewers conference that was dominated by Anheuser-Busch and he knew August and August had told him, you ought to talk to me because I was a manufacturing guy and so forth. Eventually I gave August Bush a call within some days and said, August, I just want you to know, you introduced me to Bob Lanigan. I dropped Bob a note about maybe being on our board. And August said, Bob, look at, he's already called me about it. He said, Bob Lanigan, from my perspective, is one of the finest businessmen in America. So we talked and uh, Bob subsequently asked me to go on the board. And I couldn't do it at that time. I really didn't have the time to devote to anything but the problems I had with my own company and told him that and he said well would you be willing to talk on the phone you know ever so often and that turned out to be a Sunday phone call. Bob joining our board agreeing to join our board opened my mind to others which led me to recruit Warren Shapley because Warren Shapley just retired as uh, president of Ralston Prina so Warren brought to me experience in food industry, pet food industry. Warren introduced me to Dick Ford. And Warren said, would you consider going on the board? And the three of us and Bob, we were the core group. I mean, with Bob at that point, it, was, it wasn't walk, run, fly. It was walk, fly. So I had my glass guy, my can guy, my retail guy, my banking guy, and we began to have, and we began to migrate off our operating executives as they retired, bring on board people of, of substance, of experience that could be my mentors. Bob has a natural ability in the field of acquisition. He has a natural ability to bargain and he has great discipline. Obviously, they had to be acquisitions that our banks allowed us to make. They had to be acquisitions that didn't stretch our uh, resources. And Bob had a terrific discipline in not overpaying. And there's no sense in prolonging the negotiation because we will not move at all. And that's the key to not making the bad mistake. We bought INEX, which uh, was the first acquisition uh, of the company in Denver. So now with my f new financing in place, this intense desire to reshape our business. I mean, that's one of the best decisions I made was to say that our, our history is a rich history of serving the brewing industry with washers and pasteurizers, but it did not give us a rich future. And I made that decision that we needed to reinvent ourselves. Reinventing a hundred-year-old company is always a challenge for anybody. So we needed to branch out. We needed to get into other avenues. That, sometimes it's hard for people to understand that. Following INEX, we were approached by Vickers in England to consider uh, the acquisition of Dawson, a competitor of ours in bottle washers, and they also made fillers for the dairy industry. The way that we were able to do that acquisition is by way of uh, demonstrating to them that it would be m meaningful to take preferred stock f from the company. So instead of having to use cash, we were able to use our preferred stock as currency and as you know, set dividend rate. Now we treated taking stock in Barry Wimler like paying cash, we just gave our stock. But again, it was another way that we could uh, take a look at this. The interesting thing 
uh, on INEX, our first acquisition, is this is the acquisition that when I went to the board, Bob Lanigan said to me, because he was in the glass industry, he's the largest provider of glass in the world. Bob said, it looks like a good acquisition, but Bob, you're betting your ass on your future on this acquisition. And we went to Citicorp to get financing for this acquisition because we had to go into an overfunding situation to do it, which means that we had to borrow more than we had collateral to buy this company. So we put two companies together. We moved the Boulder operation of INEX to Florida, renamed the company INEX, and, and embraced the video technology of INEX. Uh, and a long story short is we built from two sick $3 million businesses we built a $37 million business making 17% operating income. What ultimately pulled us out of the, the circumstance of being near the point of bankruptcy was when uh, there came about this idea, well, why don't you structure some sort of loan with Barry Women Limited, Dawson's and Ford Disclosures, since you know, that was a group that was a, a profitable set of companies and do an IPO for that set of companies. The acquisitions were doing well, but the historic business was still really struggling. It was pulling everything down. But from the point of our lender, the historic business was the core, and they saw the core as unhealthy. So our, uh, our team flew over from England and made a pitch to me and said, um, look at Bob, our business is doing well with the Dawson acquisition, INEX is part of it, uh, Ford's is part of it, and if we could take it public in this kind of uh, uh, secondary market. You might be able with the proceeds to pay off your debts and have $2 million in the bank. That seemed like heaven to me, having lived through the refinancing and then the asset-based lending. And I said, let's pursue it. So in May of 87, we launched, and we were selling 70% of 35 million, so we were selling about 28 million. The public market in England sent in $1.1 billion of cash trying to buy this 28 million dollars of stock. It was 30 times oversubscribed and we ended up not with two million dollars in the bank, we ended up with 28 million dollars in the bank. We couldn't borrow five million before the public offering and within a month or two the public offering people sent in trying to buy at 1.1 billion dollars in cash. So Harvard ended up doing a case study on this because as, as in the words of our directors they'd never seen such a dramatic transformation so it had growth, it had stability, it had just what the public wanted, and they responded dramatically. After that initial offering and the success that we did have, which in effect, it just, it paid all of our bank debts. That actually turned out to be our second chance. And I have to give Bob all the credit in the world because he had a vision from the, we're, we're about the same age, and, and he's a, he was a young man when he took over and was trying to find himself, trying to find where we're headed. It was a, a, an immense job. And his, uh, his vision and his uh, energy level and his dedication to making that work just carried over to other people. I learned more in that environment about creating value than you could ever have learned in a PhD in the finest universities in the world. Because we had to make it happen, we had to be creative, we had to be incredibly focused. When we stepped into this company, it was really a broken company, broken in spirit, products with no future, financial instability. You know, we were still living off the legacy of our past. It was a very thin legacy. I mean, we were near the end of our journey and the transformation we experienced in the 70s and the 80s was a total transformation. I jokingly say that you really 
can't imagine what it feels like to be where we are today unless you understand where we came from. It's like families that uh, people came over from Europe with uh, $5 in their pocket and ended up uh, creating a meaningful life and a meaningful future for their family here. And they always go back and they tell how they landed on the shore with $5 in their pocket. And through hard work and initiative, they built a future for them and their family. And I'd say to you, we landed in this company with less than $5 in our pocket not much of a future and we were able to transform this company into a company with a leadership team, a culture, a vision and financial stability. And that journey is a journey of a million miles.